Hello and welcome to the State of Human Design. My name is Jonas Sage Dempsey and I'm joined by my co-host Michael Steenbeck Lippin. It is January 4th, 2023. Yeehaw! So it's not quite the new year for the, the human designers among us. Know that the mechanical new year begins on the 21st to 22nd mm. uh, with the sun entering the gate 41. But we're in, I've heard it called the conventional new year, the calendar new year, mm. the normie new year. Mm -hmm. Um, the numerological new year, that's mm. what I just came up with. But it is, you know, because numerologically speaking, we are in the next year. Mm. Um, but it certainly isn't the human design new year, not yet. Another couple of weeks. Yeah. So, uh, we have some topics for today. But first of all, before we get into the topics, uh, how are the holidays? Uh, good, why? <laughs> no, just what people say. You enjoy uh, how's the thirty eight thirty nine going? Oh, it has been that, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, sixth line, right? Yeah, I already have the thirty eight and thirty nine. Oh, okay. So you're like <laughs> business as usual. Far for the course. Yeah. Far for the course. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fine for me. I mean, thirty eight activates my twenty eight, so I've had a bit of struggle, but mm -hmm. um, I don't have fifty five, so I haven't had uh, any exceptionally emotional times. Mm -hmm. I know some people. Actually, Travis Day posted a wonderful. Um, He's, he's a 1-3 projector, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about the 1-3. And uh, he's um, on Instagram, look up Travis Day, uh, for just really, he's been posting really wonderful Instagram stories uh, on the transits and things like that. And he posted a really good one about, you know, if you're feeling moody and stubborn right now, mm. you know, don't worry about it. It's funny that... Uh, we were like, New Year, and then mm. what, what is the energy we get for the calendar New Year every year? Stubbornness and moodiness. Mm. You know? yeah. <laughs> These are, so it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, people are always a little bit edgy and a little bit abrasive around this time. Uh, yeah, I know some 38, 39s in my life, uh, very provocative fighters, you know, mm. um, especially when it's in the center. Earth. Yeah. And uh, no awareness until after after Keepers of the Wheel, even, I think, right? It's we're gonna, we're about to have so many root activations. And right. we already do. Right. Right. We're going to both in the root, and then, yeah, so it's definitely... Root is kind of the hallmark of mutation, like, year-wise. That's the most abundance of gates that mutation has, is root gates. Every, every uh, quarter kind of has their thing, and that's the mutation one. The that makes sense, and it's the quarter of mutation, and then it's it's yeah, it's all catalyzing yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, the pressure to make things happen and to kind of uh, push it, and you know, this is our last push. This is you know, it's January fourth right now, so it's our kind of last push for the next uh, two weeks, roughly, um, to get every last bit of energy out from mm. the last cycle yeah. before we start something new. <laughs> A lot of urgency. So. Yeah, a lot of, we got to get it done and push it, and, you know, and it's, um, it, some people online were talking about having a hard time sleeping. You know, I think we still have a 6124, don't we? Oh, uh, we had it, yeah, we've had it again recently. Mm -hmm. We had it for a while, and it stopped, and now it's kind of back. Yeah. 6124, I mean, again, that's one that you have, so it's, mm -hmm. this is kind of normal. It does keep people up, though. I get kept up all the time. Yeah, by recurring, nagging thoughts, and kind of thinking the same thought, and seeing if it's changed. and mm -hmm. It's kind of like watching the pot, waiting for it to boil. Oh, yeah. So, totally. why won't it boil? Why won't it boil? Yeah. And as Ross says, you spend so much time, that the 6124 can spend so much time ruminating on their thoughts, they don't actually notice when the thought has changed. Yeah, so, so true. It's <laughs> a funny way to put it. You wake up with something new. You wake up, I mean, you're awake, but you wake up when there's just a different thought without noticing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, okay, so our first topic, so a couple weeks ago, I did a short video on Instagram, and I'm kind of dipping my toes in the water doing Instagram videos. I mostly do TikTok videos, um, and then, you know, as people on my YouTube have seen, I've done these YouTube videos, uh, although I've been mostly on TikTok the last few months. But I did an Instagram video, it's a very short one, um, talking about projector availability, and I quoted the projector Thelonious Monk, the great... Um, the great jazz, you know, a piano player and composer. And he has a, a lot of wonderful quotes, but one that I really liked was, never sound your horn, just be on the scene. Mm. And to me, Monk is one of the 
the top, top jazz musicians of all time. I mean, uh, one of my favorite Monk stories was for a downbeat jazz interview, they did the blindfold test where they would play um, different jazz musicians, you know. They, so they took Monk in and they, they didn't tell him, they didn't literally blindfold him, but they didn't tell him what they were playing. Mm. They kind of hid the record and they put on a record. Mm. And they put on a cover of his music, of a song of his, um, by Phineas Newborn Jr. He's very much like an Oscar Peterson style kind of a flashy player. Mm. And uh, Monk stood up and walked out of the room and then came back a few minutes later and they said, that bad, huh? And he said, it, it made me go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Monk was so far ahead of everyone else. You know, Phineas, it's not to knock Phineas. I have Phineas Newborn albums I love. I mean, I have Oscar Peterson albums I love. You know, We Get Requests is one of the all-time great, great jazz records. Um, they were trying to do something different. They were trying to entertain. Monk was really trying to expand people's awareness and elevate them spiritually. Mm. And it's very different. Uh, he was trying to wake people up, and he was trying to touch them and, and reach them in a different mm. way, in a deeper way. Cool. And it, I think it really fits with him being a projector and kind of guiding so many other jazz musicians to be more adventurous, to be more experimental. And he was a huge success. He didn't play for satisfaction, he played for success, you know, and, and his success was in his recognition. He was, you know, recognized all over the world um, by the mainstream as well as by, by other jazz musicians. And so looking at what he did, he didn't sound his horn for gigs. He didn't go around trying to get gigs. He was just very much a part of the texture. He was there. He was on the scene. Mm -hmm and he was available. Mm -hmm. And so what I said in my Instagram, and I've gotten some flack from this, is that I said that, you know, really, availability is not really something, generators ideally should not be available. Generators mm -hmm. ideally should be dovetailing from one activity to the next, so that their energy is always being efficiently used. Mm -hmm. And projectors need to be available. Uh, when, when projectors kind of limit, like, what I've seen is so many projectors are unavailable because of prior commitments they've made because they were trying to get some sort of success or fame or something. So they, they saw the opportunity to initiate themselves into a situation that they thought would bring them money, success, fame, whatever. And then it ties up all of their energy and they have no availability. They're actually using all their energy to manage and to maintain. Mm -hmm. I see the generators as the great maintainers. Mm -hmm. The generators are here for the day in, day out maintenance. Not that the projectors can't oversee that. The projectors are to make sure the generators aren't blocked, to make sure the generators aren't stuck, to make sure the generators go in the right direction, make sure they're working well together and they're coordinated. And what I found again and again is that an effective projector can see when two generators are duplicating each other's work mm -hmm. and can divide the labor. Mm -hmm. They can see when two generators aren't working well together and they can quash the beef. They can mm -hmm. see when generators are going in circles and they can kind of point right. them in the right direction. Um, but as far as the availability, kind of my admonishment to the projectors out there was be more available. You're not available enough. And I got some flack for that. Mm -hmm. So, thoughts? Um, well, I don't know why you were getting flack, but I think that a lot of projectors have this, um, have this, uh, lingering pain around making themselves too available in other ways where it's just like they settle for any invitation. They're like, finally someone's inviting me and it's not, a, but it's not a correct invitation, but they take it anyway. And so I think a lot of projectors out there are just like used to settling for, used to settling for invitations that don't come with all that much recognition. And so they're like, accepting any invitation that's come my way has brought me like so much pain. Like, why are you telling me to be more available? Like, if anything, I have to be more discerning. They could be framing. Yeah, I, I have never seen what you're describing. What I see is projectors who are not on the scene and then are underfoot. Mm -hmm. And it's very different. See, because what you're describing is I've heard this narrative again and again, and I've never mm -hmm. actually seen it. I've never actually seen it. What I've actually seen is projectors who are getting a lot of so-called correct invitations, overlooking them all because they're not available enough, then complaining that they don't get any invitations because they literally have ignored the last eight invitations they've gotten mm. that were correct for them, and then simultaneously getting really underfoot by initiating the way they think things should be in a situation where they're not actually part of the scene. Mm. See, I think being on the scene to me means 
be where the energy is. Mm. And so many directors are like, so many projectors, sorry, I call them directors. They kind of are, aren't they? So many projectors are saying, hey, come over here. Come over here, guys. Mm. That's not where the scene is. Why don't you go over there? Mm -hmm. Why don't you as the projector, if you show up and sit there every day, I guarantee five days go by, you're going to have more invitations than you know what to do with. Mm -hmm. The problem I've seen is that all these people are telling the projectors, come over here. Here's where the scene is. And the projectors are saying, no, I'm not going to go to that scene. You guys come to me. Mm-hmm. You guys do it on my terms. You guys mm-hmm. do what I want. I am inviting you. Mm-hmm. See, That's I don't awesome. accept projector invitations mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. I don't. This is what happened with Aaron Claire Jones. I had invited her to meet up in uh, New York. We agreed. We agreed on the day. The mm-hmm. day came. I went to the location. She stood me up. Mm-hmm. We agreed again another time. Canceled the day before or the day of. Mm-hmm. Agreed another time. Canceled the day of. She started inviting me. She would invite me every time. And I'd say, no, I can't do that. Then I would invite her. She'd say, sounds good. Then she wouldn't come. Then she'd invite me. It was a deadlock. Mm-hmm. She wouldn't come to me. I wouldn't come to her. Mm-hmm. The difference is I'm correct to not come to her mm-hmm. because I'm the generator. I'm inviting her right. to my space, exactly. to my scene. Yeah, yeah. I had the You're scene ready space. for her. Yeah, I, exactly. I had created the scene. Yeah. I invited her not just to meet me, but to meet 10 other people right, that are right. part of my scene. So that's what I get from the just be on the scene means go where the energy is. Yeah. Don't try to, don't complain of being starved for energy and then ask it to come to you. Right, right. A good point. Okay. Well, this brings me to the next question. This we got more to unpack there. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Please, please. Okay. Go on. Well, no, because it is true about like getting wrong invitations. Because a lot of people out there are going to be not self. And the, and the thing about being a projector is you're visible no matter what. You're not recognized no matter what. But you're visible. You're conspicuous. Every projector is going around being noticeable. And because of that noticeability, there are going to be people that are not getting you at all, that are bringing you into something that doesn't really have to do with you. And if you don't have strategy and authority, I mean, you have some sense that you're being invited to something just like linguistically or whatever, you might sign up to that. And then, and then you were talking about that thing. It's like then your availability for other stuff is foreclosed because you're busy being somewhere with people that don't actually get you. Okay, you're busy being somewhere with people that don't get you. Yes, that's the discernment of who is correct for you, which is so important. But yeah. again, the narrative I hear from projectors mm-hmm. is you know, very different. Basically, it's like the narrative you've just given is almost the exact opposite of mine. Mine is that the projector does not have enough energy to take invitations. Yours is that they've been burned by wrong invitations. I haven't seen that. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen their wrong invitations. I've seen that they've invited themselves or they've... I mean, I guess I guess you can say the burned by wrong invitation kind of, but to me it's more... I guess it's the wrong person or the wrong people. Mm-hmm. But I don't even see the wrong people inviting the projectors. I see them telling them, mm-hmm. hey, we're going here. Come with us. Mm-hmm. And the projector goes, okay and goes along, and they just kind of go along with yeah, the pinta yeah. and get wrapped up in the pinta. I don't even see that as a formal invitation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, I think that the people that actually go out of their way to formally invite the projector are pretty much correct. I think you can pretty much trust a formal invitation. Yeah, you're right. It's, because, it's, like the generic, you know, it's typically like the generic group invitation. Yeah, like if you're the, group the projector's text. just around, and then the, someone just like ropes them into something because they're there. Or the pinta. They're just part of the pinta. Exactly. They're yeah. just kind of going along with the pinta. It's like when you get in the group and you can't get out, they're like, hey, we're all going. Come with us. You yeah. know, that's an order. That's not an invitation. Yeah. And so many projectors get bossed around, and they go along with it. Now, to your point, I can see how there can be an addiction to the sacral energy, which causes the projector to not want or not be able to detach from, right, right, from the others, so they kind of keep going and they don't know when enough's enough. And so much of the wisdom, I've witnessed this with you as you've been in the experiment for many years, of it used to be that we'd hang out till 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. and now we might hang out till 9 p.m., yeah, you know? Yeah. And I still hang out with my generator friends late into the night, but uh, you know, you're very good about saying, like you now, you now know how to call the peak and go, wow, this was so amazing. I'm going to leave. It's not going to get any better than this. Mm. I'm just going to leave now at the peak. Yeah, 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 Hold on to that peak. Yeah, exactly. Why do I have to wait for the peak to go all the way back down? Fun, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, sh- and the projectors should do that with their creative work too, you know, park up hill or whatever. Yeah, park yeah. up hill is great advice. That was advice August Evans would always give me that she got from her writing teacher. Oh, so nice. when, when you're right, I know it's kind of common, but it's when we were, uh, she was kind of helping me in writing and she would say, when you're inspired and you know what you're going to write next, stop. Because right. then the next day, when you start again, you'll know kind of what to, yeah. Well, uh, I have one more piece of sympathy to express from your critics, <laughs> uh, which is that, you know, you and I are also, 
we've been in the experiment for a while. We're pretty used to being ourselves. We're pretty used to our lives being rich and full. And I think when you're, I remember what it was like to be less myself and to feel like I had less opportunities and to be more furtive in what I would accept. I think when you kind of hate your life or your life is boring and it seems like there's not a lot going on, then it is easy to just like, oh, see anything as my ticket out of this, right? See anything to break the monotony, anything to break the boredom. Like, finally, someone's going to give me energy for something. I don't care what it is. Mm. And that really, that sometimes that probably is a life preserver, but other times it probably is like, I don't know, life trying to show you not to, 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 to be in, in touch with yourself enough to know that this isn't really going to help you that much. You know? Yeah, it's almost, it's the test of how much you're willing to sacrifice the feel good of being around other people who give you energy. It's, a, you know, because so many, yeah, because let, let's take that situation. I've heard this again and again. I've heard, I have, you know, projectors messaging me a lot. And um, some, you know, one of the narratives that I'll hear, especially from Enneagram 4 projectors, is, well, so easy for you. You're a generator. You're this. You're that. So easy. You're at fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it's like to not have any support, not have anyone in your life, not have any, and then be told on top of this, you're not here to work and to be so oh, yeah. trapped and to have no way out. And to me, I'm like, I've literally invited you. Like, I've like mm -hmm. literally, I'm like thinking back to the seven times I invited this person and they right, just right. didn't even notice. Yeah. They didn't even notice. And then I'll say, yeah. I invited you, they go, you didn't invite me. <laughs> and I'll like go back, I'll be like, no, no, look here, I invited you here, I invited you here, I invited you here, I invited yeah. you here. And I, I offered to pick you up and I offered to this and I offered to that. And so, it, but you know. Um, that definitely happens also. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But I also think part of it is being able to be on the scene and kind of prioritizing being on the scene versus prioritizing what you think needs to happen to start right. to do or whatever. Because if you can stay on the scene, like I noticed it with a projector um, who thankfully is coming back uh, in February. Uh, she was here at the conference and she stuck around in Santa Fe and she was on the scene. And while she was on the scene, you know, we were inviting her, the invitations started very low, and then they kind of increased, and then they increased more and more. And then I was so excited for her to come for Christmas, uh, and then I found out that she wasn't here anymore. Mm -hmm. It's okay, she's going to be on the scene again, she's coming back. But it's kind of like, it takes a, a certain amount of time of just being there to become part of the texture of the place, right. and being truly available so that people can rely on you. Right. Now, I do want to go to the next topic of uh, projectors and the standing invitation. But first I want to just mention, and this is what, who I mentioned in um, my Instagram video, there's a, name, a man named Robert Raymond, Robert mm -hmm. Ray, Ray. Mm -hmm. Now he's a projector who's been in the human design experiment around 21 years. He doesn't really claim that he's been in it that long, but that's when he first had his readings and it did affect him. He did experiment and practice waiting for mutations mm -hmm. and recognition and all of it. So uh, yeah, 21 or 22 years he's been cool. in the experiment. And one of the things he said is, so he's an amazing tarot reader. He has this incredible gift. Mm. And he said, I am bound, when asked, to always provide, mm. no matter what, mm. that my most important, and he's a 2-4, he's right angle. It's not like he's paying off karma or right, anything right. like this. He just said, it's kind of a projector thing, I think. Mm. Not to serve, serving mm. is in the sacral, mm. as uh, Steve Rhodes says, mm. you know, in service, but to guide. Mm -hmm. And that, that is sort of his, um, he is honor bound by having been given cool. such tremendous gifts mm -hmm. of being able to see into people through right. Tarot and other modalities that when he is invited, he must. So he's come to a number of cool. my events. Every cool. single time I've invited him, he has come. Cool. The one time I mentioned I was going somewhere and it wasn't a real invite was to Lily on his birthday. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, I'm going to a birthday party. You want to come? And he goes, you know, very generator. And he said... Uh, I think I'll pass on this one, but let mm. me know when you'd like me to cool. buy your house, you know. But then yeah. every other invitation, yeah. he has come. And every time, he never brings it up. He never says, hey, you want to do some tarot or anything. Mm. I just always say, you got your cards? And he goes, you know. Mm. And I say, would you would you do some readings? And he mm. goes, I, I do them when I'm requested to. Cool. And so it's literally, talk about availability. Yeah. Talk about availability. Mm. He has been available to every single invitation. Mm. And he has touched so many people. I've witnessed it in person doing just a one card reading, how he can lock in and see through someone. And, you know, it's interesting because in, um, you know, one of my videos recently, I was kind of 
a couple months ago maybe, I was really uh, anti-divination, and I was really talking a lot of smack on Tarot. Mm. And it was right then that I started to witness this world master Tarot reader right. help crack people wide open mm. and, you know, completely awaken them and completely, you know, bring them into these new, new experiences, new realities, new insights. And so I, I think what I was against, just to clarify for anyone that was kind of put off by that, was the obsessional checking of the news oh, yeah. of the tarot cards. Mm -hmm. It's like being addicted to Fox News yeah. or CNN or right. something. It's like, it's like being, you know, you're checking it all the time and you're kind of, oh no, I got a this, I shouldn't do that, or, you know. That's all I was really knocking. The tarot is obviously one of the great mystical forms of, of wisdom. It's a great wisdom tradition. People, and, yeah. people do it with stocks too and with likes, with noties. People are like, what, you know, what's new? Yeah, yeah. No, and I totally get it. When I was um, doing options trading and stuff, I was kind of checking the news every day. And yeah. it's just, um, so yeah, so, so just to, to kind of wrap up on you know, Robert Ray, he's just such an, a great example to me of a projector really living his design who he's basically, he almost instantly charms everyone who meets him and they all invite him and he's sort of and this is actually a nice segue to the next topic which is projectors and the standing invitation because i do go out of my way to practically beg him to come to things mm. so i am saying please 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 you should because he's a two you know you should join me and i want you to be here and i'm going out of my way to invite him but i also have kind of extended and i've seen that he's he's been extended a sort of standing invitation in the sense that if he said, actually he did once, he said, hey Jonah, I'm going to be in town, going to better day. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you should meet me there, you know, let's mm -hmm. meet up. I kind of took it from there. He mm -hmm. informed me, mm -hmm. and then I immediately, but it's kind of, I do think that, you know, Ra used the example of a bard or troubadour mm -hmm. who travels from village to village, and that the goal of the projector, when they really reached their pinnacle of recognition and of living their design, they can kind of go anywhere and the people recognize them and immediately cook for them and mm -hmm. feed them totally. and help them. And they're really the darlings of humanity in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I liked that because I, I think maybe what people are criticizing about the standing invitation is that it's not a real invitation. It's kind of a throwaway invitation. Of, yeah, let's get together sometime. Well, that to me is not a standing invitation. A standing invitation is when you're in Santa Fe, please inform me mm -hmm. so that I may adequately invite you. Mm -hmm. You know, you were invited to inform me when you're in Santa Fe mm -hmm. so that I may put together a good enough package to sort of win your... But see, here's the other thing. For many years now, I have struggled with and tried so hard to get the projectors that I've wanted to meet, mm -hmm. that I've wanted to, to contact and be in touch with. Mm -hmm. And I still do. There are certain projectors in town who will only except maybe one out of five invitations. I mean, even, even you're kind of like this in terms of how many invitations you're actually available for. Now, I've had to accept this, that, okay, yeah, I'm not the only invitation you know, around provider. and so on. <laughs> provider. However, what I've noticed is in the case of Robert Ray, he gets invitations too. He pretty much just fulfills them. Like, hmm. like there's not really a negative to him. Like, he gets invited to something that people aren't really mystical. Like, we went to his brother's event that wasn't really a mystical night or anything. And he shows up there. He conserves his energy. He hmm. doesn't go out of his way to try to uh, change it into yeah. something else. Mm -hmm. He just stays for an hour or two and then he right. goes if it's, you know. He so knows what he's in being invited for in that instance. He's, he's optimized, well, and he's optimized his life to be able to accept every invitation. Cool. That's my point. Nice. Like, he drives and he has a good car and he and it can drive in the snow. Mm -hmm. Like, that is something that's really good for projectors to be able to do because that's a super efficient way to get around town. Mm -hmm. It's really inefficient to need rides for people. Mm -hmm. He um, He's optimized his availability by his sleep schedule and his waking schedule. He messages me at 8 a.m. and says, hey, I'm going to be in town, let's get coffee at 9. Like, it's very efficient to kind of be in sync with when other people are doing things. It's, mm -hmm. He has all of these choices that he's made to design his life in such a way as to maximize his availability mm -hmm. to everyone, every single person. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's being extremely picky and choosy, but, but to your point... In the example we had before, accepting the wrong invitation, going with a penta to a group and kind of being around these people who don't recognize you, he'll be in that situation. He'll just leave in 20 minutes. Right, right. He'll still go. Mm -hmm. He'll still give them the benefit of the doubt, and he's still optimized his life in such a way that he has enough money and he has enough 
mm-hmm. you, you know, ways to get around, and he has enough free time, and he has enough this and this and this, mm-hmm. that he can pretty much accept every invitation. Mm-hmm. Cool. And that, to me, is a kind of life goal of a projector, to be available right. to those who recognize you. Well, and each correct accepting of a correct invitation yields more of itself. And so, like, every time you practice it successfully, you're just going to get more opportunities to practice it successfully, you know? So it's like yeah. you kind of whittle down so you're only getting correct invitations in the first place. Well, you never know yeah. who you're... But you also never know who you're going to meet. And so sometimes the invitation is simply the access to the scene. Right. And so... You know, the person inviting him, like a good example is, uh, and I don't, I don't think Ray would mind me talking about this, but you know, his brother is not so excited into the mystical or anything like that and kind of just wants to have a nice party and have some wine and hang out with, you know what I mean? Right. And that might not be correct for him if, his, if Ray's agenda is more to help elevate people spiritually mm-hmm. and so on. And yet, the sort of humility of being able to kind of show up for anything, no matter how small, and then that's how we met. Mm-hmm. And then I met him there. Go, yeah. So there is this sort of beauty to being able to make yourself available to everything. Right, right. And that's what I think the ideal of the projector should be. And I've seen the exact opposite in a lot of commentaries on Instagram of saying, you know, I am exclusive and you don't have access to me unless you pay me and you don't have access to me unless this or this or this or this. Mm-hmm. That's not what the projector is here for. Mm-hmm. The projector is here to be a public utility and a resource for the guidance that others need. Mm-hmm. Not to serve them, but mm-hmm. to guide them. Right. And they're very different. Yeah. Ray will never serve anyone, anything, mm-hmm. you know, but he will guide them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess he served us when he made, he uh, he runs a farm and it grows 4,000 pounds of food a year. And, well, he has 10 people working with him and so on. And he's in charge of the whole thing. So he's, in, he's right at the, the correct place for it <laughs> at the top. But he did uh, serve us all eggs and bacon and stuff on Christmas Day, which was really lovely. But even that service was a little bit of a guidance of here's how you can give back. Mm -hmm. Now you try it. Mm -hmm. A little bit. You know, it was like he took him like 45 minutes, you know, very efficient. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He had it all set up as a as an assembly line. He delegated tasks and said, you cut this, you know. And it was wonderful and he kind of very efficiently demonstrated how it's done. Mm And so showing how to serve instead of, but he's not going to do that every day. He's going to do that once a year. Right, right. And it's going to be a great example for others of how they might serve. Mm. So anyway, lovely, lovely man. And um, for any human design folks who are planning on coming to our future HDHD events, I, I sure hope you get a chance to meet him as he is really excited to be involved in all the future events. Cool. Uh, so he's already got out of his way to uh, make it known that he's available uh, for you know anything that is, is needed. Nice. And you know what was a funny coincidence was uh, the High Desert Human Design Conference of 2022, um, this past summer, we actually had a number of attendees stay in his country garden. Oh yeah. Ray's country garden, if you look it up on uh, Airbnb. And they, they told me, you got to meet this guy, Ray. He's the coolest, loveliest man. And uh, you know I ended up meeting him randomly. Uh, Weird. You know, sometime later. No uh, choice. So, okay, Washington Post, uh, Enneagram out, human design in. Wow, this was so a- comparable. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny, it actually said Enneagrams out. Not oh. Enneagram apostrophe S, but like Enneagrams, yeah. like all the Enneagrams. All the Enneagrams, so getting rid of them. All nine of them, get out of here. All nine of them, Enneagrams <laughs> out, human design <laughs> in. Yeah. I, uh, I think it was five days ago, but it just hit the, the Instagram human design folks today. Cool. And um, it's even on the uh, private Telegram human design chat. I'm not everyone's talking about it. Thank and, you, uh, Alanis Morris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Wasn't it a couple months ago she wore, uh, you know, body a graph. Yeah, yeah. kind of classic body yeah. graph yeah. style body graph uh, shirt in one of her live performances. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe that was, yeah, that was maybe back in. August or July, July or August that she did that. But yeah, Enneagram out, human design in. I mean, I, I was a little disappointed they didn't say anything else. And I listened to the audio and they just skipped that one in the audio. They only like mm-hmm. read, read out loud about half of them. Mm-hmm. And I listened with Von Paul, who, you know, fans of my channel will likely know by now, I would imagine. <laughs> and, uh, since all I've done is Von Paul content for the past three months, I literally got a message from Mark. They, thank you so much, Marcus, for this. He said, I love your videos, but please start teaching again soon. <laughs> cool. Yes. I'm looking forward to when you begin teaching again. Is what yeah. I said. So no, it was, it's fine. It's fine. It's, um, 
But it's actually, I've been getting really good reactions to all the Hoja stories I've been doing. Von, Von's making up his own stories now. Oh, he's that. done like three. <laughs> he's made up the, but, but anyway, so I listened to them with Von, and uh, that has inspired Von to do his own out and in. And so he said, you know, lumberjack shirts, out. Hawaiian shirts, in. What? <laughs> okay. I think Hawaiian shirts were in like three years ago. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Von, you know, Von's 73 years old. Yeah. He's catching up. He's I catching see. up. Uh, no, he's actually, he's way more cutting edge. You and Vaughn are like the bleeding edge. You're where I get all my, uh, <laughs> most, mostly you is where I get my, my information from. But Vaughn also, he yeah. has his finger on the pulse. But yeah, we was listened to... 44? Not sure, actually. We um, noticed I didn't even think about it. <laughs> no. uh, but we listened to the, to the audio of the Washington Post earlier of what's out and what's in. And I was eagerly awaiting the linear image and human design. They skipped it. Weird. They went through the list and they like skipped a few. And I think they were probably like, the hell is any of it? Like, they, yeah. just, like, they just kept going, you know, and just kind of skipped over it. And um, Kanye is apparently out again. I don't know. Kanye's out? Yeah, I, I, don't, know. Not. I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> post him. Anyway, um, I'll tell you what's in is Christian R and B. Salt, S A U L T. They released they released five albums back to back, one day after the next, for the glory of God. Wow. Uh, they're a British um, Christian R and B group, and they're incredible. Wow. I, I I listen to them all the time, and then like so the car with Amber the other day, she had them on, like, cool. and they're like all over. Like mm-hmm. it's like really good. Easy listening R and B slow jams, and the mm-hmm. lyrics are just like mantras. Like the only most songs will only have like one or two sentences just repeated, wow. and it's usually like for the glory of God mm-hmm. or praise Him mm-hmm. or just kind of like just R and B kind of stuff, or like or, or, or like love is the answer. Cool. Like they're they're pretty much like all very high vibe, like positive, positive stuff. And you know you don't have to be Christian to listen to them. I I, don't, I consider myself pantheist and polytheist, you know. And, um, but you know, it's, it's certainly, uh, yeah, I just realized, uh, hopefully that won't be a problem. There we go. That should, that should be a little better. <laughs> you had to flip the microphone around? Yeah. Well, oh, now we're way louder. There we go. I see what's happening. Okay. There we go. That's a lot better. I think it, I think it turned up. I think probably the first... Half of this will have just been uh, reflected off of that wall. So <laughs> we'll have a nice echo to, uh, to our voices for the first half of it. But um, in any case, uh, yeah, so what does this mean for human design? I mean, I'm, I, for one, am excited for more people to benefit. Mm-hmm. I think it can only really bring benefit. I don't think, I guess the only danger is as the great... Uh, Mistress Claire said, when the devoted and faithful are overrun by those who are mostly curious. Oh, yeah. Cool. And that's the only real risk. Uh, It's funny, I actually met someone a couple months ago who didn't really have any curiosity in human design. We had some nice chats. And then I invited her to a human design event. She said, why why would you think I want to go to this or anything? And I said, well, you're not curious about it at all. And she's like, so that's why I should be there. And I was like, yeah, like you're not oh, curious. Yeah. You're not curious means Good. that you're actually like potentially, you know, um, able to kind of get some of it because you're curious about other things in life, but you're not just like, oh, I wonder what this is, you know, mm-hmm. because the curiosity is often wants to be appeased. It's curious until until some condition is met, at which point mm. the curiosity has been appeased. Mm. But when you're not curious and you can get into human design, mm. it's a little bit different, right? So, mm. so yeah, what, is, what does this mean? You know, Washington Post saying human design in. Well, I mean, 2023 is the, maybe the year of human design. I mean, it's interesting that it took seven years after Ra's passing for there to be the first explosion of human design. Mm. And then since then... Um, we're kind of in now the seven year lead up to uh, 2027. Gotcha. We're about halfway through it almost. And um, yeah, we're really, we're really seeing human design ramp up and uh, seeing it, it kind of reach critical mass in many areas. Mm. Although in some areas it hasn't. For instance, I was in London a few months ago and there is no human design scene, scene mm. there. There are some incredible human design practitioners like Paul Lawrence Curtis, the, the, the incredible, amazing painter. Mm. Um, 
and you know, Sandra Zito and, and some folks I met up with there, T.R. St. Clair was there when I was in London, mm. and yet there's no weekly meetup anywhere in London. Mm. And we had a weekly meetup here for years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, it goes to show that, you know, even in a city like London, and I went to um, Blackwell's and all these famous classic occult bookshops and so on, and mm. uh, none of them knew about human design, anything beyond Chetan Parkin, and I think that was it, maybe Karen Curry Parker. Mm. They didn't have, you know, the definitive guide. They didn't have any materials by Rod wow. and nothing. In the whole city, I went to every esoteric bookshop. Crazy. And I asked everyone in all of them, and nobody knew about it. You can get those books here at the Ark. They got they got Chet and Parkin. They got uh, Richard Red, shit like that. I'm I'm being a little more forgiving of Red now that I've uh, I've started reading his Seven Seals book, and I really like mm. it actually. I I like certain aspects of of Red more than I used to. Hmm. Maybe I've gained a little empathy, or uh, maybe his fourth line is just finally influencing me. I don't know. <laughs> That's nice. He's a four six. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so what about Godheads? Um, yeah, let's skip it. Let's talk well, more I... about the state of human design this year. Because it's interesting, because just like um, in the zeitgeist also, I think that some of the more pop HD stuff is becoming more normalized. Like some of the, you know, stuff that... Because it's interesting to have a fringe within a fringe, right? Human design's already fringe, and then there's the the fringe part of it that is like turning it in, turning it into a commodity or whatever, or turning it into, or being contaminated with other new agey stuff, like. But that's becoming more solidified and crystallized, and it's more common than ever to hear, you know, the manifestation style stuff or the which is in the nodes. Is that where it's claimed? Is that Gen um, Gen I think Zoe? it's just variable in general. Yeah, that's Genesoe. Is yeah, that yeah. who originated that? What's up with this Jonah Zoe account on Instagram? What's I, I can, that? There's someone made a spoof account called Jonah Zoe, combining <laughs> Jonah Dempsey and Jonah Zoe. And cool. I don't, I, they haven't posted anything yet, but they followed me. Uh -huh. They followed Jonah Zoe what too. So I don't know. They follow like a few people. Yeah. Uh, I follow them. I'm waiting for them to post something. So if you are Jonah Zoe, please post something. I'm looking forward to some good memes. <laughs> yeah. But okay, so you're saying that it's more solidified in the sense that um, like there have been enough students and then students of students that yeah, it's kind yeah. of turned into a this is a factual right. basis enough, of a, right enough misinformation out there i guess for that misinformation to i mean well and that's the question though is is it misinformation i don't i haven't studied it at or all. is it a mutation yeah i haven't studied i mean i don't know that was just a random example sure just, sure I there are many yeah, yeah. yeah um but I don't know, yeah, because that's another thing you said, uh, being overrun by the curious. You're also going to be overrun by the people trying to make a quick buck and stuff like that, you know, or the people that... There's the curious, and then there's the sort of... Um, there's the good faith curious, and then there's the curious who are trying to uh, shoehorn it into whatever they already believe about the world, right? They're actually not very curious. They're just... Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're more... Um... I wouldn't even say opportunistic because that can be a fourth line thing. I mean, you can take an opportunity to become enlightened. You can take an opportunity to, you know, wake up and live your design. Um, yeah, I, I would say, I see what you're saying. It's more uh, those who have a will to power. And mm. their will to power will use any means necessary to, oh, yeah, to yeah. obtain power. Right, right, right. Yeah. And they see human design as another avenue for obtaining power. Right, right, right. Or just another thing to busy themselves with, you know, because also these people that just restlessly looking for answers to this or that, that are just willing to pick up and play with any toy they find, you know. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, so, and then I guess, so, okay, so but just going back to, there's this, we've now gotten far enough that there are kind of non-standard interpretations of human design that are solidifying, and they're... You're saying they're kind of mostly intertwined with manifestation culture, which I see as in intricately intertwined with money. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so totally. money is a huge part of that. And, uh, you know, Ra would always liken money to prana and to breathing. Mm -hmm. And w in his money course, he kind of talks about when you're living your design, you, you're breathing correctly, you're getting the money that you need. Cool. You're breathing in, you're, you're making the money, you're breathing mm -hmm. out, you're spending the money. Nice. Um, but I can see how there, there's actually two, two points, two kind of tangents I want to touch on. One is my favorite Lacan quote, mm. or you know, one of them. Uh, it's hard to choose, just one. Um, but where he was asked why he refuses to treat the wealthy. Mm. Do you remember this one? He, mm -hmm. he oh, said, wait, actually, yeah, I do. Yes. They, uh, 
they know how to buy things, but they don't know how to pay or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And what is the difference in buying and paying, right? And it's it's yeah. that you can buy a reading, but you have to pay right. day in and day out with mm-hmm. your sacrifice right. of all of those comforts of the not self that kept you homogenized and living out um, your not self. And so, you know, that's how you pay. Mm-hmm. You pay through in a daily basis and you pay with everything, you know, mm-hmm. but by the end of it, you have given every last thing you can. Mm-hmm. Um, the opportunity to sacrifice is really the greatest gift any of us can have. Mm-hmm. And so many people are so afraid of losing or sacrificing. And yet that is actually the highest spiritual value um, is to sacrifice. And that's what we're all doing. I mean, Ross sacrificed his whole life for human design. And for us as well, for bringing it to us, which why is, is part of his the, purpose. Why is it the highest value? Simply because it is the, the true meaning of surrender. When you've surrendered, you have instantaneous acceptance of whatever comes in your life. And so mm. it doesn't mean, you know, I'm not saying that Ra as a ego manifester desire, if somebody told him, you know, um, or like a good example would be when he became $500,000 in debt when Loki was, when, right. when his, his wife gave birth to Loki's three months before, three months premature. And so he had to pay $500,000 and go mm-hmm. into debt and sell his home and everything. You might say, okay, well, if you're going to, I mean, surrender to that, then maybe you should just give up human design because it's life telling you that, you know, you came wow. here to do human design and you were punished in this way and so on. He wow. didn't give up. He didn't yeah. give up. And yet... He also didn't fight against that sacrifice. Mm-hmm. He sacrificed not only his money and his home and everything else, mm-hmm. he even sacrificed his feeling of being owed a debt mm-hmm. and his resentment over how life mm-hmm. had given him a raw cool. deal. Mm-hmm. He even, you know, that's what I mean by sacrifice is the highest value. You could basically say surrender is the highest mm-hmm. value. To me, they're mm-hmm. equivalent. Mm-hmm. That when you're really surrendering, you have instantaneous acceptance of the events that occur in your life without mm-hmm. resistance, without thinking that you know better mm-hmm. than what life mm-hmm. has, has brought to you. And so he even sacrificed his idyllic life um, in anonymity in order to be a public figure Mm -hmm. and to be lambasted and and so on uh, as a crank and all the other things that were said about him when he presented this knowledge to the world. So that's all I mean as sacrifice is kind of the highest value is that Mm -hmm. to even be given the opportunity to sacrifice is something we should be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And yet so many, when confronted with sacrifice, only know how to buy, Mm -hmm. not how to pay. Mm-hmm. because sacrifice is paying mm-hmm. you know you're really paying <laughs> you're paying with what is dearest to you I rewatched. Um, I, I've had a cold you know the last week and I watched a bunch of dumb movies and actually one of them was uh, the Avengers uh, Endgame and the, you know the one before it uh, Infinity Wars have you seen those? Mm-mm. oh they are extremely human design you know adjacent and they're mm. all about levels of initiation and they're very much about the rays and all this stuff mm. each of the crystals in the glove are kind of like one of the centers or one of the mm. one cool. of the theosophical rays which is actually what Ra was studying when he had his encounter with the voice mm-hmm. and uh, there's one part where there's the soul stone and the soul stone requires that you sacrifice what is dearest to you mm. to obtain it Mm-hmm. And uh, that is something that each of us must confront at some point mm-hmm. or you know another in, in our lives, and because what is dearest to us is the control of the mind, or the apparent control of the mind mm-hmm. in its free will, right, right. the appearance of free will to direct the life, and mm-hmm. so sacrificing our own closest uh, heartfelt um, sort of love for the not self, mm-hmm. so that we may truly learn to love the self. Mm-hmm which is something that we must learn and must develop and cultivate. It is not given. Mm-hmm. So, um, but in any case, um, yeah, that was the one tangent. And then the other was just the relationship to money. And there's a wonderful, wonderful video. I hope it's still online somewhere. If you look up Elaine Badu, you know, Alan Badu, A-L-A-I-N. Um, Badu is B-A-D-I-O-U. And uh, he talks about money and he says that money is the stand-in for desire. But because there's no limit put on money, Mm. it gives the illusion of infinite desire or of the ability for desire to be infinitely appeased. Mm. And so in some sense, he says, the unit of currency being a stand-in for desire, then we, we kind of know from psychoanalysis that desire is infinite in that sense and that you can never... Even in human design, we see with uh, the gate of desire, gate 30, mm. and the gate 41, mm. the fantasy that leads to the desire. Uh, once you get it, you, don't, you can't desire what you already have. Right. And so once you get the money, you can't just 
desire to have half the money that you already have. You have to desire more money. And mm. it creates, and he says that money as, basically, this is paraphrasing, but money as stand-in for desire because of its infinite nature, it can be printed up endlessly mm. and created endlessly, then leads to infinite competition. Mm -hmm. And there's no end mm. to the competition. Wow. And so, and the competition, and because the resources are truly finite, mm -hmm. we have this disconnect between the infinite representation of mm -hmm. infinite desire being infinitely fulfilled mm -hmm. and the finite limitation of actual lived life. Mm -hmm. And this disconnect creates a schizophrenia that cuts through ah. our entire you know, Western culture mm -hmm. and Eastern culture, all cultures at this mm -hmm. point, because yeah. we have essentially all come under the umbrella of late stage capitalism. Right. So... Um, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting point that um, you know money is not the root of evil per se, but competition is an unnecessary and unfortunate side effect of when the infinite when the representation of the infinite collides with the actuality of the finite. Hmm. You know, and and how they kind of and then we compete over the finite resources because of the fantasy of our desires being fulfilled. If I had more money, I would be more fulfilled. Right. Is the fantasy. And as we know from human design, that's not true. Right. Not true at all. Fulfillment comes from living your design. You're fulfilled when you're successful. Mm. You can have more success having a, in a single conversation with one person than in all the money in the world. Mm. You know, it's... Um, and it's not that having more money would help you feel more success. The, the money is there, but... Success comes from, from guiding and from helping and from touching others, really. It's also interesting that, um, that industrialism occurred kind of at the beginning of the whole movement of the nine-centered way of being, and that part of the work of the nine-centered being, something you've been talking about lately, is having to cleave apart the heart and the G-center. So that sort of, and it's our ongoing work. We haven't fully done that. Desire from spirit. Mm -hmm. And that when they're cl cleft... Um, that the heart is it feels an intense alienation and it feel it goes through its its pain of privation mm. uh, because it is no longer identified with the capital S self mm. that Jung mm -hmm. that Jung uh, was the first great uh, expounder of. Mm. And, um, so yeah, no that that is that is part of our project here is to bear the alienation and to not retreat into a sort of narcissistic identification with the self. Mm. And I think that can be um, a real challenge for all of us collectively as well as individually, whether you have a defined ego or not, whether you have a defined G-center or not. Mm, interesting. So, so I did want to... Um, it's okay. If, so for Godheads, though, I did want to just... I, I've been thinking a lot about the Godheads, too. So I might have one topic, or unless there's anything else to say on the topic of money and so on. The one thing I've been thinking about um, is really polytheism versus monotheism and i've been thinking about what it means to be monotheist with regards to the godhead versus polytheist which is a sort of acceptance of each of the godhead's roles as necessary because monotheism is really just saying one sixteenth is valid and the other 15 sixteenths aren't right and we can see it as a literal monotheism, but we can also see it as a sort of figurative monotheism where it's really easy to espouse the values that you yourself possess mm. because you've been imprinted in them and they're in your DNA. Right. <laughs> and you said it's cheap for you and expensive for others. That's so exactly, that. exactly. So I've been kind of thinking about this lately of, um, and I mean, you can extend it beyond the Godhead, so you could extend it to, to, and actually this thought kind of began with the Steve Rhodes material for me anyway, when I started realizing, wow, um, success-driven people who have tones one and two in their sun earths, mm. uh, compared to respect-driven people, tones three and four, compared to feeling-driven people, tones mm. five and six, each one of them can sort of espouse its, its own way as the supreme way and can reject the others. And it can be really hard to even imagine I think this is one of the great values of Steve Rhodes for me. Say you're double respect. You're, that means you have tones three or four on either on both personality and design side. Well, you're going to be so offended if people disrespect you. Now say you don't have any respect tones. You're not going to care about respect. And you're not going to be offended yourself if people disrespect you because you won't even recognize it as disrespect because mm -hmm. all you care about is success or feeling, which mm -hmm. don't really have any concern for respect. 
So it's it's kind of a a similar. I, I I guess the high level is just if we're going to urge ourselves to be polytheist in embracing the value of all sixty four gates, mm. because as we know, each godhead rules over four gates. Mm -hmm. If we're going to espouse the value of all sixty four gates, we should also espouse the value of all tones and all colors mm. and so on. And that can be hard to do because it can be so invisible to us. If you're feeling disrespected and you're a respect tone person, realize that your feeling of being affronted, of being disrespected, mm. that is what's keeping you in the not self and keeping you prejudiced against people for whom respect is not a currency, mm. is not a commodity. Mm. Um, I, I won't name names, but there were two people I know who were highly offended. One was highly offended after the HDHD conference, the first one, and the other was highly offended after the second one. And both of them have respect tones. Mm. And the people who offended them don't have respect tones. Mm. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, without going too much into detail on that, I would just say there's a Tich Nhat Tan quote, which I think is, it perfectly summarizes it. I've been talking about it on my TikTok. Uh, a monk goes to the middle of a lake on a wooden boat to meditate. A couple hours go by. His eyes closed, and he feels another wooden boat bump up against his. He immediately thinks, who is this person who would be so inconsiderate mm -hmm. as to crash into my boat and disturb me? Mm -hmm. He opens his eyes, and the other boat is empty. Wow. Cool. All anger comes from within. Mm -hmm. All reaction comes from within. Mm -hmm. Designed knowledge is the knowledge of how not to react, mm -hmm. of how to abstain from habitual reactions, right. of how to you know, wait to actually respond or wait to actually be invited or wait for your emotional clarity mm -hmm. or wait for whatever it is you're waiting for. Wait for the right time to initiate. Mm -hmm. Wait for things to become clear through the transits and so on um, and the activations. And these and, are sort of like tiny sacrifices too, not having the reactions. Yeah, these sacrificing your ability to feel affronted. Sacrificing, mm -hmm. right? The monk, his eyes are closed. The boat hits his boat. He immediately thinks... Ah, in anger, mm -hmm. who is such an idiot that would crash into me? And he opens his eyes and there's no one there. Mm -hmm. There's no one there. And that's, and so anytime someone does something to insult you or offend you, they are the empty boat. That person is the empty boat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the no blame credo that, that, that we technically have in human design, but doesn't get thrown around enough in my opinion. I love no blame. Oh, my <laughs> word. Yeah. Right up there with no choice. No, <laughs> no choice, no blame. Yeah. That should be the, the two sides of the same thing. Truly. Really. Okay. Well, I think I guess we just have one more topic because we kind of already covered HD Gestalt. Unless you have anything more on that? Any more? Oh, oh no. Yeah. We, we touched on that. So the last topic is just Alokanand Diaz is having a retreat in Costa Rica thrown by Chaitanya FX. I'm so excited when I uh, signed up for it. I didn't know if anyone I knew would be there. And now I got the list of people who are going to be there and I know like eight of the people and I'm really happy. Hmm. Every single name that I recognized on that list, I am thrilled to be attending with them. And uh, so I'll report back when I'm when I'm back in town if, uh, if I am able to, unless I'm sworn to secrecy. We'll see. Cool. <laughs> but um, I'm really excited about it and uh, I think, I hope it becomes an annual event. Uh, it's two whole weeks. Uh, Alok is doing two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off, which mm. is a nice rhythm to it. It's very affordable. I was really happy to see that they were able to make, um, you know, uh, and, and they actually, not only was it affordable, they did a really nice contest where people could give $64 to enter into um, like a raffle to oh, get. Cool to get a ticket potentially and someone of course won the ticket so they're they're going to go for only $64 which is great okay. um, plus I guess airfare but yeah I'm really excited I've never been to Costa Rica before so any viewers who know the area I'll be staying in uh, nearby Yaco uh, spelled like Jaco J-A-C-O and I thought that was funny because we have a good friend named Jaco and um, yeah I'm really excited uh, to be down there and so if anyone has tips or tricks for Costa Rica please let me know uh, and uh, yeah, just wanted to kind of make that that you know announcement that it's exciting to me that, uh, and I hope it happens every year. We'll see. This is the first year, so mm. it'll be about thirty of us down there. I think twenty five or thirty. Mm. So. Excellent. Any parting shots? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for watching, and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Uh, hopefully, it'll probably be when I'm back from Costa Rica. And I, 
hope to have some uh, interesting stories and news to share. Thank you, Mike, for such wonderful commentary as always. Yeah, so. we're back, baby. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs>